Welcome to our webinars. My name is Sidiko Rakolote from the Progressive Social Economic Investment Institute. It is a public benefit trust that do public benefit activities. One of those activities is to host webinars discussing various topics. As of December 31st, as of the 31st of December 2020, approximately 50 billion notes of US dollars valuing over 1 trillion US dollars were circulating outside of the US. What makes the US dollar a dominant currency in the world? Why are countries trading with each other using US dollars instead of using own currencies? Today we look at the US dollar system and its contradictions. Ladies and gentlemen, we are so humbled to have a director of geopolitical economy, research group, and convener of international manifesto group. The professor Desai is at the Department of Political Studies at the University of Manitoba in Canada, but today she, she's joining us all the way from London. Over to you, Prof. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a great pleasure and privilege to be here uh, at this uh, Progressive Socioeconomic Investment Institute seminar, and thanks particularly to Mr. Rakolote for inviting me. Uh, so as he said today, I'm going to talk about the dollar system, um, and particularly I'm going to focus on um, its contradictions. So I'm going to tell you what the dominant story is, which is always talking about how strong the dollar system is and so on. And then I want to focus on two things, particularly one, the increasing challenges that uh, it is facing. As you know, South Africa is a member of the BRICS uh, uh, organization. And uh, 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 for the last several years, uh, uh, one of the dominant uh, elements of the conversation over the BRICS has been to create an alternative to the dollar system because its problems and contradictions are being increasingly recognized. So I will talk about primarily about the problems of the dollar system, and then I look forward to uh, to uh, talking with you in the question and answer session uh, more more thoroughly. And so I think uh, Mr. Rakolote has said that I will speak for about fifty minutes, and then we will go to um, questions and answers. So first of all, let me just give you an idea of some of the ways in which I have been developing my ideas about the dollar system. So. Of course, I've been thinking about this for decades, in fact, but in particular, I want to mention my 2013 book, Geopolitical Economy, which you see to the left here, which was published in 2013, in which I put forward a critique, uh, not only of uh, ideas like globalization, but also idea the idea of US hegemony, both of which try to construct the world economy as a seamless whole. Uh, in which national states don't matter. And I'm very critical of th that sort of way of looking at the world economy. So, and, and, and a large part of this book involved a critique of the dollar system. And then last year, I published my newest book, Capitalism, Coronavirus and War, A Geopolitical Economy, and in which I also further develop the same ideas, uh, bringing uh, the analysis up to date uh, over the last decade. And uh, in this case, in particular, I'm very, and also developing the analysis more deeply and more broadly. And I want to emphasize in particular that this book is actually open access. So you basically just look for capitalism, coronavirus and war, a geopolitical economy, and it will take you to a website from which you can download the PDF for free. You only pay if you want the full, if you want a paper copy. So uh, uh, I hope that uh, many of you will check this out. Um, and I want to also mention this paper that I wrote, which is also available. You can download it for free in Russian and English, um, which I co-wrote with Professor Michael Hudson uh, called Beyond the Dollar Creditocracy, again, talking about it from a geopolitical economy perspective, which was published in 2021. And finally, I want to mention a show that I do uh, every uh, uh, every fortnight, basically, with Professor Hudson. Usually, sometimes I have some other people, but uh, and sometimes we have some other people as well. But in which we discuss 
various uh, uh, ways of understanding how the world economy really works, you know, why there is so much debt, why there is inflation, how the world order is changing, moving away from the Western dominance to something else, what that something else is, and so on. And I should add that about four of the earliest shows that we did in this series, and we began uh, last year around this time, Four of these shows are actually directly about the dollar system. So you may, if you like what I'm saying here, you may want to check those out as well. Okay, so let's um, jump into the actual substance of my talk. So in outline, this is what I want to do. First of all, I want to tell you what the official story about the dollar's world role is, which uh, so that it so, so that we know what is the view we are criticizing, because essentially what I'm going to do is criticize this official story, which is full of holes and is it rests on a completely uh, fanciful ideas about how the world world's money should be provided. So uh, that's what we'll do first. Then I will be going, uh, I will be talking about why de-dollarization is happening. And the way I look at it, I think that there are at least two different things that are independently uh, assailing the dollar system. The first are the external challenges. So we will, I will run through them, but in general, you will recognize as I do that, that these challenges have been widely discussed and canvassed. So I won't want to spend less time on those although we can come back to them in the question and answer session, and more time on that part, the second pillar of de-dollarization, which I feel is rarely discussed, which is the internal contradictions of the dollar system, which are rarely mentioned and even less understood. Um, so we want to focus on understanding what they are. What is the, uh, so what are, you know, some of the elements of what I will discuss is what is wrong with the idea that the national currency of one country, no matter how strong, how powerful, how nice or bad, uh, 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 what, what's wrong with the idea that the currency of a single country should serve as world money? Uh, what was the sterling system? This is important because the dollar system always looks back to the sterling system. It says, you know, just as uh, the pound sterling. So, sorry, do you want to mute this person? Maybe I will do that. Um, okay, that's good. That's muted. Okay, so um, sorry. Now where's my? Yes. Uh, so 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 so. Uh, what's wrong with this idea then? And they look back to the sterling system, and they say just as sterling dominated the world economy in the late uh, to, uh, 19th and early 20th century, so the dollar was dominating the world economy today. So we will examine what the sterling system was and what was wrong with it. And then once we do that, it will become very clear why the dollar could never stably serve the world as the world's money. And we will go through how it in fact hasn't. Um, so I call it really a non-system or some people use the word the dollar order and I call it the dollar disorder. So we will look at that. Then I will spend a few minutes just trying pointing out why is it that this, which should become quite obvious to you by the time we are done with this lecture. If this is the case, why do most scholars, why are they prevented from seeing this reality? And finally, we will end with what are the principles that should guide the creation of alternative arrangements. And here uh, you'll be interested. Let me just flag this from the start, which is that most people think that the dollar will only stop being the world's money once there is a successor to the dollar. And my answer will surprise you because this is exactly the scenario which is, number one, impossible and number two, in any case, undesirable. So we don't we're not looking for a successor to the dollar. We're looking for something else to replace the dollar. OK. So let's uh, go into what the official story is. So the official story of the US dollar's world role is rooted in what I, what I and many other scholars call hegemony stability theory. That's the idea that uh, the there is that should that the world economy in order for it to run properly the capitalist world economy needs a leading power usually the most powerful capitalist country no matter how defined to essentially uh, provide leadership exercise hegemony over the world and one 
element of this hegemony, perhaps the most important element of this hegemony, is that its currency serves as the world's money. So uh, hegemony stability theory says that the US is doing today what the UK did in the 19th century and before the UK for a brief and much earlier time, mostly pre-capitalist or very early capitalist times, the Netherlands performed such a role. And then before that, the Italian city state. So that's a very rough view, but it's rooted in that sort of idea. And I have argued in my geopolitical economy that hegemony stability theory is really not a theory. It is not a accurate description of how uh, hegemony has worked, how world money has worked or anything of the sort. All what it, hegemony stability theory is, is that it is a... Ah, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, what hegemony stability theory really is, is that um, it's, it's, it gives theoretical dress to a desire nursed by ruling circles in the United States going back to the early 20th century to replace sterling as world's money with their own currency and to replace Britain's power over the world economy with their own power. And so that's what will happen. So hegemony stability theory is what it's rooted in. And it says the following things. First, that the currency of the most powerful country is the natural currency to serve as world money. Uh, it argues that uh, what the dollar is doing today is merely taking over the baton from the UK, from Britain. Uh, and therefore, the, uh, you, uh, the United States is taking over the baton from the UK or Britain and the dollar is doing the same vis-a-vis -vis sterling. Um, they also point out that the, the, just, you know, just how powerful and stable the dollar is as world's money uh, is demonstrated by the fact that even though back in 1971, the United States had to break the dollar's link with gold because it ceased to be able to back the dollar with gold. It just did not have enough gold. It had issued so many dollars it did not have enough gold and people thought that this would be um, a big problem. But they say, look, you see, the United States got rid of the gold backing and even then the dollar is serving as world money. So that is often pointed to by the official story as a sign of the strength of the dollar system. It is also uh, argued very often that by allowing its currency to be used by the world, the United States is performing a public service to the world, just as our governments perform public services, whether they are running, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, providing justice, law and order, maybe even providing utilities, housing, whatever. These are all public services. And this is what the U.S. is doing for the world out of the kindness of its heart. Um, a further claim that is made is that the U.S. can uh, 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 the U.S. dollar can serve as the world's money because, like Britain in the 19th century and the early 20th century, the U.S. enjoys a, a very complex, sophisticated financial system. It has financial markets that are deep and wide. So this is this is what permits the dollar system to operate as the world's money. And there is also a, 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 an argument that is made, which is that despite much talk of de-dollarization, particularly coming from BRICS countries, and of course, this talk has become increasingly powerful um, uh, 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 since the uh, since early 2022 uh, with the launch of the of Russia's special military operations in Ukraine, because as many of you will know, the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, froze Russia's uh, reserves, which about half of them were uh, in the possession of various financial institutions outside Russia. And the U.S. has used the jurisdiction it exercises over these Western financial institutions to essentially free freeze rather the uh, uh, foreign reserves of the United uh, of of Russia, uh, which amount to about three hundred billion dollars. The U.S. has done this previously. Of course, some of you may know that it sequestered, for example, Afghanistan's reserves, but they were to the tune of nine billion. It has done similar things to Iran, to Venezuela, etc. But Russia is a much more powerful country. It's a member of the permanent, it's a permanent member of the Security Council. It's a nuclear power, blah, blah, etc. So when this happened to Russia, 
people suddenly realize that there is a deep problem. The, this is known as the weaponization of the dollar system. So people have realized this is a deep problem. And so as a consequence, the, the urgency of de-dollarization has been felt in many quarters around the world. So despite all this talk, the official story claims that, hmm, what's happening here? Yeah. The official story claims that the dollar's role is quite stable. Now, as you can see here, for example, this is from a um, uh, uh, from a uh, document produced by the Federal Reserve itself, uh, which is essentially making the argument that the dollar's world role is stable. There's nothing to worry about. So they point to things like this. They say uh, the dollar dollar's share of total foreign exchange reserves, which you see here, the blue blue sections of each bar is the dollar's uh, 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 share. Uh, the This orange section is the euro, the British pound in green, the Japanese yen in blue, the Chinese renminbi in this orange color, and then other currencies in this pink color. So, so people say, well, yeah, it's declining a little bit, but on the whole, it's holding stable. Another figure they use very often is the share of uh, the US dollar in foreign exchange transactions, which has held fairly stable. Uh, over the last, uh, 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 well, this this is from the for over the last couple of decades. So you can see it has declined a little bit, but not much. And again, uh, so this shows that the U.S. is U.S. is part of eighty eight percent of all. On, the U.S. dollar is on one side of eighty eight percent of all transactions. Um, Similarly, they point out that um, uh, uh, that that, uh, that the share of the dollar, you know, when currencies, say for for instance, South Africa or Turkey or whatever any country, issues bonds in a foreign currency, not its own currency. So South Africa issues bonds not in rand but in uh, dollar in some other currency. They will likely choose the dollar. So here again, you see the different currencies, and the dollar is has a high uh, 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 share of that, and so on. So they present figures like this. So people are left very impressed that actually, yeah, sure, the dollar's role must be very stable. But of course, we will be uh, pu putting many holes in this argument. A further point which the dominant uh, 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 discourse uh, makes about the dollar system and why it is not likely to be dislodged anytime soon is that there is no successor currency to the dollar. They say, you know, look, we are looking around, where is the successor to the dollar? The renminbi can't do it. The euro has been around for more than 20 years now. It hasn't done it. So there is no successor currency. Never, so that's the official story. And, and to most people, uh, uh, if you read any newspaper, most commentary will be repeating the same points again and again. So most people are not even aware that there is another story. But what we do know is that today the dollar faces both external challenges and it's sorry, I, this should say internal here, but and its internal contradictions are mounting. So let's look at both those things. So first, I just want to briefly mention uh, uh, the external challenges, but we won't go into that in any great detail. So. The fact of the matter is that the U.S. dollar share of foreign exchange reserves and international transactions has been declining. The only reason why you don't see them in the figures that I showed you earlier is because bulk of the decline took place in the period before. So if you compare, if you showed the entire period from 1945 onwards, you will see that in the period uh, uh, after, 19, uh, after the 1970s, there was actually quite a big decline in both of these cases. But then... Since then, it has stabilized at the present uh, level. Uh, secondly, uh, as you know, with the uh, uh, decline of Western economies and the US economy, with increasing amounts of outsourcing, with the increasing power, the shift in the center of gravity of the world economy away from the US and the West and towards China, and other BRICS countries and so on, these countries increasingly began to demand that there should be a reform of the classic Bretton Woods institutions, such as the IMF, the World Bank, the WTO, and so on, particularly the IMF and the World Bank. So this pressure has been growing for the last many decades. But on the whole, the US and other Western countries who have most of the voting power in these institutions have not uh, 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 agreed to this 
And uh, so in that sense, the pressure is there, but the reform has failed. So as a result, what these countries led by China have said is, look, all right, if you won't reform the existing institutions, we are going to create new ones. So as we see over the last decade, in particular, a number of new multilateral institutions have been created, particularly the new development bank or the BRICS bank the BRICS uh, uh, contingency reserve agency and, and uh, arrangement and so on. In addition, uh, there are also a number of China-centered institutions, projects and organizations that are increasingly playing a much more important role. And China in particular is emerging as a major financial power, which is responsible for more and more lending around the world. And I'm here speaking of institutions such as the Asian Invest uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank, the Belt and Road Initiative, and more generally lending by Chinese financial institutions. And remember that Chinese banks are some of the biggest banks in the world. These institutions have been lending uh, uh, often on very favorable basis to a lot of third world countries in particular. Further, increasingly, there are bilateral agreements to use non-Western currencies in uh, the various um, uh, 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 in 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 the various uh, 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 among various countries. So, for example, uh, more and more India and uh, Russia, for example, have agreed to rupee ruble trade. Uh, more in Russia and China have agreed to trade in each other's currencies. Uh, Russia and Iran, similarly, uh, India and Iran, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So more and more countries are uh, coming up with agreements to trade in one another's currencies, and if you do that, then you can easily eliminate the dollar from your mutual relations. And by the way, if you think about it, the euro has been exactly that. It has basically been an agreement among European countries to eliminate the dollar from their mutual relations. And this arrangement has been reasonably successful. And its faults are not because they have eliminated the dollar, but has to do with the internal architecture of the system, which we can discuss later. Also, increasingly, there are swap agreements between the central banks of the various uh, BRICS countries in particular. So they are essentially making their own currencies available to other uh, central banks in order to, to use them to settle imbalances, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, more, moreover, uh, among the payment system, as you know, the international payment system is dominated by a system called SWIFT, which is controlled by Western countries. So in place of uh, these um, Western countries, what we are seeing is, uh, sorry, I'm just going to mute this person as well. Yeah. What we are seeing is that um, countries like Russia, the EU, uh, e even the EU, as well as China are creating new systems. So S SPFS is being created by Russia. Instex has been created by the EU. SIPs by China. And moreover, each of these countries uh, and, and others are also experimenting with having more and more sophisticated electronic domestic payment systems. So China has union pay. And very often, for example, you may not know this, but in men uh, union pay, which is primarily a domestic company, so it's a bit like having a, a visa or MasterCard type system, union pay can be used to make payments even in countries like Canada or some places in Canada or the US or elsewhere. Similarly, uh, Russia has MIRPAY, India has RUPAY, Brazil has ELO, and so on. And more and more international coordination among these domestic payment systems is increasing. Further, there is a lot of talk, and again, this will be the subject of an entirely uh, a, a, a seminar of its own or a webinar of its own, but the potential to create central bank digital currencies and use them in replacement uh, for using the dollar uh, in international payments is very great. And this uh, more and more countries and central banks are looking at creating central bank digital currencies. And of course, finally, uh, the uh, weaponization of the dollar by the US itself, you know, not just in the case of Russia, but as I said previously, in the case of many other countries, and also the uh, 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 imposition of financial sa sanctions, which essentially amount to weaponizing the U.S. financial system in order to punish those which the U.S. does not like, not necessarily those that have been found at fault by international law. Indeed, as you know, the U.S. increasingly flouts international law and instead names something that it calls the rules-based international order. But the rules of this order are not clear. 
And so the world finds itself in a situation where, you know, if, uh, the following situation, imagine if you if you suddenly got a letter or a phone call from your bank saying your all your deposits here are uh, we have we are taking them over. You cannot have access to your account. You cannot use your deposits. You have lost them. You would never bank with such an outfit anymore. So the U.S. is claim to provide a public service to the world is undermined by the weaponization of the dollar system and the credibility of the dollar system is undermined when the US weaponizes uh, the dollar and the financial system. So those are the external challenges. But like I said, apart from listing them, I don't want to talk about them very much. What I want to talk about is the internal contradictions of the dollar system. So let's go into that. So first of all, I want to deal with the, this question. Can national currencies uh, be a world currency? So, sorry, this should say be a world currency. Okay, so the first thing you have to know is that money is national. One does not have to be a charterless, that is to say that school of money, which is generally disregarded as wrong, uh, which believes that states can essentially create money and do whatever they like with money. That is not strictly speaking true, but that does not mean that states have nothing to do with the creation of money. Indeed, the state's uh, money has historically always been national, particularly in modern times. So domestically, I would say, you know, people point to gold coins and say, you know, commodities are money. Gold is money. Silver is money. We don't need national currencies. National currencies are fiat money, etc. In real, the reality is much more complex. Domestically, precious metal coins of olden times, such as these, derive their value not from the metal content. So they may have had, you know, they may have been made of gold or silver or what have you, uh, but they did not derive their value from the metal content. They derived their value from the sovereign who minted them and promised to exchange them for the metal at face value in case of wear and tear or clipping. So you see, imagine that a pound coin, supposing one once upon a time contained 10 grams of gold. Fine, maybe it did. But over time through use, there is wear and tear. So eventually as the coin circulates, it loses the gold that it has in it. And some people were even known to clip little bits of gold off the coin. But as long as there was that imprimatur of the sovereign and with, which was a promise that if you took that faulty co coin to the mint then the sovereign's mint would exchange it with a new coin with the right amount of gold in it so what gave money its currency was not in fact the metal content but rather the promise to exchange this coin for a coin with the correct metal content Thus, these coins were in Marx's words, and Marx discusses this in a very wonderful way. He says that they had already become symbols of themselves. And this was the essential uh, distinction which opened the way to paper money. Because at the end of the day, if the coin itself was a symbol of a X amount of gold, then so could be a piece of paper, which was, you know, issued by the government. So that was the first point I want to make. So, inter so, so, so governments do, sovereigns make money. Now, internationally, there is no world state. And I would argue that there cannot be a world state as long as we have a capitalist economy, uh, as long as substantial capitalist economies are still in existence. So there is no world state and therefore there can be no world money. And that is why, historically, only commodities like gold, not in coin form, but in bullion form, have served as money. And quite frankly, that means that, in fact, there is no world money because bullion is not money. It's a commodity. Um, sorry, if somebody could please mute people when they come in, that would be very good. Um, Okay. Yeah, so, so apologies, Prof. will do that. Apologies. Yeah. Okay. So, um, right. So uh, internationally, since there is no world state that, and there cannot be under capitalism, there is no world money. And when bullion serves as world money, it is not 
serving as money, it's it's serving as a commodity. So in fact, what you have is not a money economy, but a barter economy. So national currencies can serve as money only briefly, unstably, and through exceptional contrivances. So the short answer is national currencies cannot be world money. So if that's the case, how did sterling become world money? And the gist of my story is that it, it, it was served, it was able to serve as world money because it was an imperial, not a national currency. Let's look at this point more closely. So this is a old style pound note. Um, and uh, in sterling, essentially, what the what sterling was was often people lazily refer to sterling as uh, the you know the the era of the sterling dominance from roughly eighteen seventy to roughly nineteen fourteen. This uh, uh, this they call it the gold standard period. But in reality, people scholars would say it was actually a gold exchange standard because it was not gold that circulated, but sterling notes like this one that circulated. So uh, and and the point about uh, when the, the role of gold in the system was such that they the uh, if you if 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 you demanded it you could exchange a sterling note for gold for uh, whatever the equivalent amount in gold was. So so st uh, 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 sterling notes could be, but they nearly never were exchanged for gold, and they weren't because. People were happy with the promise. You know, if I, I know that I can any time exchange my sterling note for gold, then I'm not going to run around constantly exchanging it for gold. I'm happy. I'm confident that it can be should I need to do so. So gold's price was only the benchmark of sterling's value. So gold price essentially served as a benchmark for sterling's value. It was not uh, 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 the gold standard did not function on the basis of gold. Um, and in reality, the Bank of England, which was which conducted the essentially the gold standard, actually uh, did so uh, 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 with very little gold. That is to say, it did not, in fact, possess gold to exchange every uh, sterling note that it had issued with gold. Instead, what it the reason it was able to maintain the confidence. Uh, in the sterling was because it ha because Britain at the time had an international creditor position. It was creditor to the rest of the world. It lent money to the rest of the world. And on top of that, Britain had a peculiar type of financial system, which offered only short term commercial and rentier credit. That is to say, it did not lend for long term productive investment, uh, for example, in setting up steel mills or uh, mines or farms or what have you. It did not lend on a long-term basis, but on a short-term basis, as I say, for commercial and rentier purposes. And in this, so it, it, in this sense, her financial system was diametrically opposed to the kind of financial system that in that era, the fast industrializers such as Germany or the United States had. And they industrialized very fast precisely because they had a very different type of financial system which was capable of lending on a long-term basis for productive investment. And so these countries industrialized and began to challenge Britain in this period. Uh, and they their financial system was based on long-term patient lending for industrial development. Indeed, Britain's financial system, by contrast, was responsible for her industrial decline after 1870. So the very type of financial system that made it possible for Britain to operate the gold standard was responsible over the same period, the period of the gold standard from, eight, eight, from 1870 onwards, was responsible for Britain's industrial decline because in this period, Britain began losing ground. It had once been the workshop of the world, like China is today, but it began losing this position to other industrializers like Germany and the US and later Japan as well. So, uh, and therefore the funds, uh, 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 and, and there's one other point that is very important to remember, the funds that Britain turned, so, so, so sorry, one, one thing I should say before I go to the next point. Britain in this context provided the world with liquidity, that is to say it made sterling available to the world by exporting capital. 
So the sterling standard relied, and this is a very important thing. You must remember this when we come to the dollar system, because the dollar system relies on importing capital. Britain and the sterling system relied on exporting capital. And the funds that Britain, the funds that enable Britain to export capital have a very important and interesting origin, particularly from the point of view of the rest of the world, the third world developing countries, whatever you want to call us. Um, so the funds Britain turned into her fabled capital exports that provided uh, the world with the sterling liquidity were extracted from its non-settler colonies. Now, you know, people talk about colonialism and they think that all the colonies were the same, but there was one very important difference. And you in South Africa will know this. Um, there was... The, there were the settler colonies, such as Canada, the United uh, Canada, once upon a time, the US, Australia, New Zealand, etc. And then there were the non-settler colonies like um, uh, India, the Caribbean, most of Africa, etc. So Britain extracted funds from the non-settler colonies in the form of home charges, so they, uh, India had to pay Britain for the privilege of being ruled by Britain. Uh, Britain would arbitrarily take gifts from India. And Britain would confiscate the sterling surpluses, which uh, her countries within her territories within her empire, like India, for example, earned uh, by running an running a trade surplus with the rest of the world. People forget, you know, people don't know this, but in the late 19th and early 20th century, India was next to the United States, the biggest exporting country in the world. And remember, at that time, India included present-day Pakistan and Bangladesh. So India was the second largest uh, exporting economy after the US at that time. So these trade surpluses were, India did not benefit from those trade surpluses. India did not get this money and get to invest it in her own productive capacity. This money was essentially taken over by Britain and then exported as capital exports. So the, the funds came essentially from the non-settler colonies, but they went primarily to Europe and Britain's settler colonies, like the former settler colony of the US and other settler colonies such as Canada, Australia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it is not a surprise, therefore, that most of Europe the United States and Britain's settler colonies all industrialized in the period of the Sterling Standard. So essentially, it was a colonial arrangement. I have the, um, I have a map here which I'll show you. So essentially, you see these blue lines. This is where the surpluses are being extracted from, from the Caribbean, from Africa, and in very big. The, in, the exploitation of India was much greater proportionally. And that's why, by the way, India was known as the jewel in the crown, because India yielded such huge surpluses for Britain. So the money went from these parts of the world, and then they went to Canada, the United States, Europe, uh, Australia, and of course, to some extent, to South Africa, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, where it was, of course, used for the privileged white minority and its welfare and industrialization of an economy from which only the white minority benefited. But nevertheless, it went there as well. So Keynes says, you know, and this is uh, another point I've, I've written also very uh, a paper. If you're interested, I can send it to you a paper on Keynes's first book. You know, Keynes's first book, uh, Keynes graduated from a, a, a university and went directly to work for the India office, which next to the treasury was the most important government department in the country. Because the India office, of course, looked after the affairs of this jewel in the crown, the most important colony Britain had. Um, and as a result of knowing how, uh, how the uh, how, how result of being in the India office, Keynes published his first book called Indian Currency and Finance. And around the world, it is regarded as a primer on the gold standard. So uh, the question you must ask is, why would a book on Indian currency and finance be regarded as a primer, a textbook on how the gold standard function? The reason is because of the centrality of India to the operation of the sterling standard. And anyway, um, 
Keynes disco discovers the genius of the sterling system in Indian currency and finance. And he points out that the Bank of England, quote, held less gold than the central bank of any other first class power, far less than even the Kaja of the Argentine. But it still met its international engagements with promptness and certainty. Thanks to the working of Britain's front line of defense, her international creditor position, and her short-termist financial sector. They permitted, so how did they permit Britain to operate the gold standard with very little gold? Very simply, when, uh, 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 so they permitted Britain to counter gold claims for immediate payment. So if Britain had to pay gold for, uh, you know, essentially come up with gold for immediate payment, um, Britain would counter this by counterbalancing claims for equally immediate payment. And you can only do this, by the way, when you have a short term financial system. You can't do it if your money is tied up in for the long term. So it would counter this by uh, it would issue counterbalancing claims simply by raising the bank rate. Um, the London money market was prompted to reduce international lending below claims falling due. This was the critical mechanism through which it worked. And it could not work if Britain had a financial system geared towards uh, industrialization. Okay, so uh, thus the sterling system was therefore an instance of an imperial currency, not a national currency. That is why a book on Indian currency and finance could be widely regarded as a textbook on the sterling system. But even with these advantages, uh, the imperial currency, the sterling standard, was facing a lot of difficulties. Domestically, the increasingly organized working class resisted periodic adjustments or decreases in wages and employment that the system's functioning required. Because every time Britain had to increase the lending rate, it tightened fin uh, financial conditions and therefore it restricted employment and economic activity. Internationally, rival powers like Germany linked to gold in order to make their own currencies more widely acceptable, and they constituted a challenge to sterling. Furthermore, British manufacturing interests and British industry was hurt by this system because the financial system was geared towards exporting capital elsewhere rather than funding industrialization at home. And even so, sterling was never the only currency. The mark, the franc, etc. were widely used and the gold standard was only sporadically and opportunistically adhered to by various countries. And finally, Britain's capital exports had nothing to do with her industrial prowess. Indeed, they marked her industrial decline. So that's how sterling became, became international money. So then how why do we talk? How can we talk about the dollar succeeding sterling? In fact, it did not. At best, it was a non-system because without an empire, with an already multipolar world, things could only be worse for the dollar. Remember, the United States came to lead the capitalist world at a time when after, you know, for a brief time up to about the late 19th century, Britain was the main industrial power. But with the industrialization of Germany, the United States, Japan, the world had already become multipolar. So if the productive power is spread around the world, it's much harder for the United States to become to, to impose its will on the rest of the world. Um, and ironically, the weakening of the sterling system on the one hand prompted U.S. ruling classes to aspire to replace sterling with the dollar system. And on the other hand, it signified the working of factors such as the weakening of imperialism signified by communism and decolonization that would ensure that the dollar system would become unstable. So by the time the U US came to try to be the leader of the world, not only did it have to contend with rival capitalist powers you know, elsewhere, but it also had to contend with the presence of communism in the world. So, Without vast tribute paying colonies, the US could never export capital. So the alternative method of providing the world with liquidity uh, with dollars was to run deficits. And this method was subject to the Triffin Dilemma. What is the Triffin Dilemma? It comes, it, the name derives from the Belgian economist Robert Triffin, who testified before Congress in 1960. As long ago as that, he pointed to the fundamental problem 
with the dollar system. He said that there is a contradiction contingent on the fact that the national currency also plays the, a role as an international reserve currency. He says a sustained flow of dollars and liquidity by essentially running deficits, fueling global trade implied continuous and persistent deficits in the US, con cons consequently eroding confidence in the dollar and its reserve currency role leading to instability. And as some of you may know, I mean, if you're old enough, you know it, but if you don't know what began to happen in the already in the post Second World War period is that countries like France in particular said, we don't want your valueless dollars because the United States was printing dollars, suffering from inflation. And they said, we don't want your valueless dollars. We would like gold instead. So essentially, from already from the late 50s onwards, gold began draining out of the United States and going to European countries in particular. And as a result, uh, 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 the gold, you know, the, already by the early 60s, the US did not have enough gold to meet its payment. And it tried to, you know, to, to back, sorry, to back the dollar. It tried to create all sorts of temporary arrangements to keep the dollars backing, but these eventually failed. And in 1971, um, the dollar, uh, the dollars linked to gold, which had been promised in the post Second World War period at $35 an ounce of gold had to be broken, the gold window was closed. So until 1971, the dollar's fortunes were determined by the US's deteriorating current account position because it was spending a lot of money abroad, particularly on its military adventures. Remember the Vietnam War, the Korean War, et cetera, et cetera. And also its trade position began to deteriorate already in this period. So in 1971, the first phase of the dollar's world role ended. And many people say, well, you know, the dollar system is, is very stable and sustainable because even after 1971, nothing happened. The dollar has retained, remained the world's money. But the problem with saying that is that in reality, the dollar's position since 1971 has relied on a series of financializations. And what do I mean by that? Reckless expansion of dollar denominated financial activity, which inevitably has led to regular crises. So in the 1970s, for example, there was enormous amount of, of uh, uh, the financialization of the 1970s took the form of uh, lending particularly to third world countries, which is in, 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 in ended up in the third world debt crisis. In the 1980s, Japan lent lots of money to the dollar, which ended up with the, driving the dollar so high that the, there had to be a plaza accord to end it. In the 1990s, you had a stock market bubble uh, and 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 uh, 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 and before that, of course, you had uh, the uh, money flowing to the various East Asian countries. Uh, also in dollars and essentially uh, uh, creating the East Asian financial crisis there. And after that, we had the stock market crisis of 2000, the stock, uh, the so-called dot-com bubble. And in the 2000s, you had the housing and credit bubble with burst in 2008, which many people call the global financial crisis, but I call the North Atlantic financial crisis because it was basically European, uh, British and European financial institutions that had invested in the toxic securities generated by the US financial system in that decade. And today, after the 2008 financial uh, uh, crash, uh, there was much talk of um, re-regulating the financial sector to prevent any such crisis from occurring. But such regulation was actually very mild and did nothing to bring this problem of regular financial crisis under control. And as a result, today, people are talking about a so-called everything bubble. So as uh, some of you may have noticed the uh, strange phenomenon that the US economy is doing quite badly, particularly during the pandemic, it was tanking, while every type of financial market, whether it was stocks, bonds, uh, private equity, real estate, everything was continuously going up. And this is what you get. Uh, in the present kind of economy that you have. And this is what the dollar system relies on. So the point is that once you get, um, sorry, once you get this uh, kind of uh, 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 dollar system, then essentially 
uh, although the U.S. economy is not doing well and therefore the trade demand for dollars is not high, essentially the U.S. has opened a giant casino so that people, especially rich people around the world, want to put their money in the dollar system, which artificially raises the demand for uh, dollars and thereby counteracts the Triffin dilemma. So the U.S. is still running deficits. They are bigger than ever. But this uh, the downward pressure on the dollar is counteracted by uh, the vast expansion of dollar-denominated financial activity. So essentially, therefore, uh, 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 its internal contradictions uh, uh, are, are great. First of all, it requires astronomical amounts of financialization. It undermines the U.S.'s own productive economy. The U.S. investment rate over the same period since 1971 has been a fraction of what it needs to be if it is to stand up to the challenge of China and many other countries. Uh, so it undermines the productive economy. It has burdened U.S. households, businesses, uh, uh, and government with debt because essentially uh, 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 this debt is essentially the way in which money is created. And of course, there have been regular financial crises in the US, particularly uh, with the 1987 stock market crash, the uh, dot-com crash, the 2008 crisis. And today, uh, I would say that the newest financial crisis has already started with the bankruptcy of Silicon Valley Bank last year and so on. So this, th these are the problems it creates for the U.S. itself. But the, for the rest of the world as well, that this dollar system, the post-78 dollar system, has never served the world very well because it has also caused regular financial crisis around the world. It systematically undervalues the currencies of the rest of the world, which means that those who have dollars can enjoy uh, the labor and commodities of the rest of the world at bargain basement prices. Uh, it has also been responsible for reverse capital flows. You know, normally you'd think that capital should flow from the countries and institutions and people which have a surfeit of them to the poorer countries which need the capital for their industrialization. But on the contrary, this system is serving to suck out dollars and capital from the developing countries and transferring them to the already developed countries, which do not invest them productively and only cre expand the financial system, which essentially is, it involves rentier activity, uh, profiting without producing, and so on. So it also it, it therefore systematically misallocates capital to speculation rather than production. And finally, it leads to wars. If you think about it, uh, many of the wars of the recent past, whether it is Libya or Iraq, for example, have been waged because the countries concerned were looking for ways of escaping the dollar system. Saddam Hussein, Muammar Gaddafi were doing exactly that. And the United States obviously wanted to put an end to this enterprise. So... I would say that the mounting internal contradictions of the dollar system, which is where we come to now. Uh, sorry, I'm taking a little longer than I should, but I hope to end in about 10 minutes. Um, OK, so essentially, uh, the, uh, the internal contradictions have been particularly manifest in the um, uh, in, in the more recent period, particularly since 2008. And as I've already said, there has been no uh, serious regulation since then because financialization and the kind of uh, financial system the U.S. has acquired in the past many decades, the highly financialized system is necessary. It, it, is, the, it is the foundation of the dollar system. So uh, in this context, what we have witnessed is that uh, the U.S.'s international investment position has been negative. So it already went negative in the early 2000s, you know, a lot, a lot of the time people said that the dollars, uh, we should not worry about the dollar system because the U.S.'s international investment position is positive. But after 2000, it has been negative and has declined more or less consistently since then, as you can see here. And so essentially, sorry, the meaning of this is that foreigners are investing more in the U.S. than the U.S. is investing abroad. And most of this money is not being invested productively either in the US. Further, the amount of money that is coming into the casino, that is the US financial system, has also been declining. So here you see 
a, a chart uh, from a McKinsey Institute uh, report uh, from uh, 2017, which shows a gross cross-border capital flow. So they went from a very low level in the 1990s. This is the East Asian bubble here, which was a rise of, and then this is the dot-com bubble. And of course, this here, huge big thing is the, two, the, the 2008 financial bubble. Most of this money is dollar denominated. And then you see a decline in international capital flows. So less money going into the dollar system. And then there is a recovery, but that recovery still had remained much short of about 65% of the peak of 2007. Uh, so that means that uh, the amount of money going into the dollar system has been declining, which means that the exactly the, the 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 flows that kept up the upward pressure on the dollar are going down. Um, there is also a, 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 a decline in central bank uh, foreign exchange reserves. So over the two thousands, we have seen that the U.S. the share of the USD in foreign exchange reserves has been going down. Um, I won't go into that uh, very much, but this is the important thing. Um, so. Now, in order to, in, to, to continue the financialization, to keep inviting money into the dollar system, the US has been running a easy money uh, policy. So easy money means that people can always uh, 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 in, uh, 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 borrow money in order to invest in asset markets. And of course, this large amount of borrowed money keeps asset markets going up. So the easy money policy, which includes zero or low interest rate policy and quantitative easing, which means the uh, U.S. essentially buying illiquid assets from the financial system and giving them cash in return. This, these policies have kept the casino going. Uh, but today, that is also uh, uh, reaching a, a limit of sorts. And that limit can be seen in the expansion of the U.S. Federal Reserve's balance sheets. That is to say the U.S. Federal Reserve is now participating in the asset markets, buying these assets, securities, etc. So you see here, uh, before about 2008, the U.S. Federal Reserve had about less than $1 trillion in its reserves. Then it went to above $2 trillion and it kind of remained there. But then the quantitative easing policy essentially increased it to about a little over $4 trillion. But over the pandemic, this has again double, uh, uh, more than doubled to about $9 trillion. And uh, there was some tapering off. The Federal Reserve was selling off these assets back into the market. The problem the Federal Reserve faces now is that it's selling these reserves back into the market or sell, selling these assets back into the market, but who is going to buy them? There isn't enough, there aren't enough buyers. And this is happening precisely when the United States government is actually going to issue even more uh, 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 bonds because it's borrowing more from the international market. So, uh, uh, and of course, financial regulation has remained lax. Now, in the present context with the return of inflation, which is itself a result of uh, uh, the unproductive U.S. economy and a decline of its imperial power, its power to compel the rest of the world to sell its goods and services cheaply to the United States, has put the Federal Reserve on the horns of a dilemma. And this is just, if you're interested, uh, a paper, a short paper I wrote examining this dilemma. Um, so what is the dilemma? In order to tackle inflation, the Federal Reserve will only raise interest rates. It will not uh, 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 solve it in any other way. So it will raise interest rates, but raising interest rates threatens the financial system. So in many ways, the, uh, the U U.S. is uh, caught between some people, as some people put it, monetary stability, that is to say bringing down inflation, and financial stability. The two, it cannot have both at the same time. If it does not tackle inflation, so it, it is afraid to tackle inflation by raising interest rates because it will cause financial instability. But not tackling inflation means that the dollar's value will decline anyway, making it unattractive and also affecting the U U.S. productive economy, weakening it further. So, uh, and of course, more recently, as you know, the U.S. continues to increase its debt ceiling 
and that, that is actually leading to a further expansion of U.S. debt, which is unsustainable, and more and more people are writing about it. So either there, there will be a financial crisis in the U.S. debt, or there will be a financial crisis, the bursting of the everything bubble, which in many ways is already underway, and any number of triggers could trigger this down. Now, I feel that I've taken long enough, so I will wrap up uh, simply by um, maybe not talking about this, but just talking about this here. So if the dollar system is such a problematic thing, then what should we replace it with? Well, not with another national currency trying to be a world currency. At the end of the Second World War, John Maynard Keynes had himself proposed a very interesting arrangement, which more and more people are talking about, which he called an international clearing union and bank or. So he basically proposed that there should be an international clearing union, which would be a kind of a, not exactly a world central bank, but a quasi world central bank. And it would issue a currency called bank or. But this would not be a currency that you and I would use to buy a chocolate bar or a T-shirt or a pair of shoes or what have you. Every country would retain its national currency, which it should try to manage for its own productive expansion. And in order to enable this, was uh, the, the, the international imbalances would be settled by an international clearing union and bank or. So essentially countries would be issued with bank or based on their trade needs. Its value would be based on some 30 commodities. It would operate with a system of capital controls. Um, and there would be creditor and surplus country engagement. One of the geniuses of Keynes's policy was that um, uh, you know, you only need money to settle imbalances if there are imbalances. If if there are two countries, one country exports $100 worth to another country, and that country exports $100 worth to the first country, there is nothing to, there is, there, there is no need for any money to settle any imbalances. Trade is balanced. So the idea was to reduce as much as possible the need for Banco by creating balanced trade. And balanced trade is also good because what we have today is a, so, so creditor adjustment means that the countries in the advantageous position should take responsibility for increasing the uh, uh, amount of, um, uh, so, so for increasing the capacity of the disadvantaged countries to improve their productive capacity so that they are no longer running persistent deficits. So this sort of creditor adjustment was also important. And this is, um, this is important because essentially Keynes was now speaking for a weak economy, he was speaking for Britain, and he knew Britain's economy had become weakened, so he needed to create an international system which would be kind to the weaker economies, and that would be most economies in the world, and that's why it's a good arrangement. Um, but uh, such an arrangement is not possible as long as the US and the West refuse to, to create such arrangements. However, Regional arrangements, like I've already mentioned, are already being made in lieu of this kind of universal arrangements. And as these arrangements are made, we should keep some principles in mind. Number one, capital controls are very important. You can't really have a productive economy if rich people and big corporations are free to take money in and out of the economy as they please. There must be capital controls. And also there must be capital controls in order that the international uh, 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 trade and investment relations can be properly managed. The system should be based on multilateralism, not imperial dominance. It should be geared to trade and investment needs and not to financial speculation. And by the way, capital controls are also important to curb speculation. Uh, it should, as I said, be based on creditor responsibility alongside debtor responsibility, surplus country responsibility alongside deficit country responsibility, and it should focus on creating balanced growth. Today, one of the big problems is that the, the United States dollar system relies on persistent imbalances because that's the only way you can expand the dollar's world role. This would rely on limiting the need for bank or by limiting imbalances in the world economy.
Many people worry that, you know, the 200 plus countries in the world can never agree. But I would say that the problem is not the number of countries, but the system of imperialism. If countries agree to cooperate rather than dominate, then agreement will be much more possible. And I would say that advancing multipolarity, which is also advancing equality uh, among countries, and the removal of relations of dominance and subordination will show that agreement is possible. So having gone on for a bit longer than necessary, I will end here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Desai, uh, for your informative and very educational presentation. I started to receive some questions from the some media platforms. One, one comment is that Prof is only talking about the disadvantages of using US dollar and not talking about the disadvantage. There's an, I mean, the advantage. There's an advantage of using a US dollar because those countries benefits to get hold of a stable currency that doesn't inflate. What is Prof's comment on that? Did you hear well, that? Sure. Uh, first of all, I would say that uh, the U.S. is uh, uh, the uh, uh, I, I haven't showed you that chart, but if you look at a chart of the trade weighted uh, dollar, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the value of the dollar, which the Federal Reserve publishes, you will see that uh, over time, the value of the dollar has consistently declined. So, in fact, it is not a very stable, uh, 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 stable, uh, 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 what's the word for it, a stable store of value. That's the first thing. And secondly, consider, considering all the disadvantages, the systematic devaluation of the labor and prices of the commodities that we third world pe people produce, is that a price worth paying? Uh, it, the only people uh, in developing countries that the dollar system serves are the richest people. So the advantages, the other disadvantages include regular financial crises. Do we want to have regular financial crises? That's partly why the world economy is in the sorry state that it is today. And look at it the other way. China does not have the U.S.'s kind of dollars, uh, U.S.'s kind of financial system, and nor does Germany. And they, they will not because having such a system means paying the price of deindustrialization, and they don't want to do so. Yeah, thank you so much, Prof. And uh, for the hand, uh, Dr. Matlala, you can take the mic. Dr. Matlala, your hand is up. You can unmute Dr. Matlala and post your question. While Dr. Matlala is still trying to unmute and post a question, let me check other questions. Other people, please. Feel free to also to raise your comments and, 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 and questions. Dr. Matala, your hand is up. Let me check uh, from my Facebook page if there's some questions. While Dr. Matala is uh, trying to... The other comment is that Prof... Um, what is the link between neocolonialism and imperialism on the issue of U.S. dollar trading? That's 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 the question. Sorry, on the issue of what? Side. Sorry, on the issue of what? What is the what is the, what is the link of neocolonialism and imperialism on the U.S. Dollar trading. So, is there any link of imperialism or neocolonialism? That's what the question well, is. Okay, so first of all, the term neocolonialism is just, to me, it's just a synonym of imperialism. Like, uh, neocolonialism is a term which Kwame Nkrumah, I believe, pioneered the use of uh, to refer to the fact that even though formal colonialism had ended, uh, the dominance, the economic dominance, and the political dominance of the imperial countries continued. So he said that colonialism may have ended, but we have a neo-colonialism. So, uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that, so the relationship between the continuance of imperial relationship and the dollar system is this, that essentially the uh, it, 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 it sort of uh, 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 imposes the dollar 
on the world, forcing the, the world to use it, rather than enabling the world to, uh, to come to a set of arrangements, which uh, are, you know, about international money, which will be conducive to the growth and development of the world. So the dollar system actually prevents the developing world from developing. This is the, one of the key messages, and it does so, like I said, by devaluing the currency, by organizing massive financial flows in the opposite direction, not towards developing countries, but away from developing countries. Uh, it, uh, uh, in, it inflicts regular financial crises. It requires financial openness on the part of developing countries. Uh, when, in fact, what they need in order to develop is precisely a system of capital controls. I could go on, but there are many, many ways, some of which have, most of which I've already spoken of in the talk. So that is the relationship between the role of the dollar. And remember, you, you mentioned the trading system, but the trade-related use of the dollar <laughs> pales in comparison to the purely financial use. Like, consider this. I think the annual value of trade today uh, for the world as a whole is some $32 trillion, okay? $32 trillion. The value of money crossing borders for any reason, whatever, which includes trade, but it is not trade, is $7 trillion per day. Multiply $7 trillion by 365 days, you will get over 2000 trillion dollars so trade has nothing to do with the dollar system the dollar system is a huge bubble which mm. is burdening the productive and trading and commercial economy of the world and nor is the dollar system being able to provide for the system for, for essentially provide funding for development <laughs> The kind of economic system that the dollar system requires every country to have is precisely the opposite of what the world needs if it is to develop, what the developing countries need if they are to develop. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Matala, you are unmuted now. You can uh, post your comments and questions. Okay, th thank you very much, Mr. Akolita. And then thank you very much, uh, Prof, uh, uh, for, for your presentation. Uh, my, my question is, Prof, since this subject of the, 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 uh, the dollarization is being on the cut, it's been on the table for quite some time. I mean, you also indicated that uh, Europe uh, uh, attempted to de-dollarize de de uh, with, the, with their euro. But uh, we, we've seen this campaign being unsuccessful for over years that has been talks about it and all this. What do you attribute as being some of the factors that causes this uh, uh, failures, that causes the, 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 the unsuccessful uh, do the dollarization? Despite that, yes, of course, there is no available uh, uh, currency that will replace uh, the dollar at the moment. So Thank you. first of all, let me clarify that I'm precisely saying that we need to replace the dollar not with another country's currency. We need to replace it with a multilaterally agreed system like the Bancor proposes of, um, of John Maynard Keynes. So that's the first clarification. The second clarification I'd like to make is that the euro has not failed. The euro has been entirely successful vis-a-vis -vis the dollar because the euro has eliminated the use of the dollar in the economic relations of European countries amongst themselves. The, I agree that the euro has some problems, but that has nothing to do with this element. The euro has problems because it is essentially uh, 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 brought countries, uh, 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 it has essentially... Um, uh, 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 no, it, it is not founded on the right principles. Like it has brought many countries of differing pro productivity levels within the same currency zone. If you are going to do that, you need something like fiscal federalism. You need some efforts to 
uh, create uh, equality among the various countries of the world in terms of productive power. And those arrangements are lacking. But if those arrangements are put in place, I would say that that would that would essentially solve. You know, the problem with the euro is that it has basically been a way in which Germany can run persistent surpluses within the European Union. But as you see, that's why I emphasize the creditor adjustment responsibility. Germany needs to enable Greece and every other country that is running persistent trade deficits within the European Union to increase their capacity to produce things that they can export to other countries. And that would be, a, and, and if, they, if Germany did that, there would be no problem within the Europe. I hope that's clear. All right. Yes, it, it, it is clear, Prof. But uh, I mean, if, if you look at the the the, the euro, uh, the penetration of the euro, particularly outside Europe, uh, as compared to what the, the dollar is, is to, to, uh, the levels of the dollar. Yes, you still. There is still that element that uh, there is still a dominant dollar around across the the the, the global economy as compared to what the, the the euro has penetrated so far. So hence, I'm saying yes, the euro. I, I still think that the euro also hasn't really uh, done much. In, in, in I I think in, my main point is not getting across. I don't think that the dollar system can be ended with another currency. Okay. You see, I'm trying to say that the successor to the dollar system cannot be another currency, even if it is the euro. It cannot be the renminbi. It cannot be the euro. It has to be a multilaterally created currency, which is only used among central banks to settle imbalances. Okay, no, th th thanks on that, Prof. So, so the so the the fact that the euro has not made, uh, 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 not made great. Uh, first of all, the euro has affected the dollar's international acceptability because uh, it has brought it. Ever since the euro has come into being, the acceptance of the dollar has been considerably reduced. But then it has remained at the same level. The chief reason the euro does not want to. <coughs> Uh, uh, expand its international use in the on the dollar model is because if it does so, it will destroy Europe's productive economy as it has destroyed as the dollar system has destroyed the U United States productive economy. Same okay. reason why the Japanese do not want to internationalize the yen and the same reason why the Chinese do not wish to internationalize their currency. If they internationalize their currency on the model of the dollar, they will only destroy their own productive economies. Okay, thanks, Dr. Pro. I think uh, Mr. Raccolote is uh, joining by another machine. I see another question here from. I'm here. I'm here. Ah, I had okay. a problem. I had a problem with my my network. So there is there is a hand from Kina. Please, Kina, pose your question. No, I think the professor covered me when it comes to this uh, explanation with regard to China and is uh, when he she says China that is why China doesn't want to internationalize its a uh, uh, currency because my question was going to say uh, why this uh, Europe doesn't have that much impact hence according to the value of the money if I'm not mistaken euro seems to be more higher than a, a, a US dollar but I think she touched the question unless if she says she wants to make me Tierra. thank you very much uh, yeah, so I mean, much, the Tina. thing, sorry. Please, no, please. Thank you so much, Tina. You can go on, Prof. Uh, yeah, okay. So, so uh, I would say that um, the only thing I would add as a further clarification is that um, the 
basis on which the euro acquires and retains its value is very different from the basis on which the US does. The US dollar may appreciate vis-a-vis -vis the euro in some instances, but that is on the basis of extremely destructive forms of financialization, which are not good for the US and not good for the world. That's what we have to understand. So uh, uh, it's not a question of the relative strength of the euro vis-a-vis -vis the strength of the dollar or, or any such thing. The problem is with the dollar system itself. And the dollar system, by the way, as I say, if we have another financial crisis, its longevity cannot be uh, assumed. Uh, and it can also suffer from a lot of other problems. I mean, you know, we are in an election year in the United States. Things are looking extremely unstable. We don't know what will happen, uh, whether the election will be held successfully or not. All of these things may affect the dollar adversely. In fact, I would say that another implication of what I'm saying is that the dollar system is actually very fragile and ready to collapse. And the question really for the rest of the world is, do we have uh, arrangements in place to cope with that? Because we are going to have to come up with such an arrangement and it cannot be replacing the US dollar with the currency of another country. That's the key. Yeah. Before I was I was uh, locked out, there was a question in the chat box, but I can't see that question again. I, I can see it actually. Um, yeah, what please. is the relation? It is from uh, Maya or Maja. Um, what is the relationship between the colonialism and the dollar? If there isn't, what stops African countries to create their own currency? So I think I've already explained the relationship between neocolonialism, imperialism, colonialism, and the dollar. So let me uh, just say, uh, uh, address the last question. So first of all, let me say that African countries already have their own currencies. Every African country has its own currency. The problem is that these currencies are not only weak, but they are kept weak by a dollar system, which number one, imposes upon them uh, a, a, a artificial undervaluation which is not good for Africans or anywhere, Asians for that matter, Latin Americans, etc. And number two, it requires the imposition of a neoliberal policy regime, uh, which prevents the development of African countries, because at the end of the day, what we want, what all developing countries want is to create genuine development. And you're not going to get that as long as the dollar system continues to operate and impose its requirements on African countries, Asian countries, et cetera. So I, I hope so. So the point is African countries already have their own currency. What they need is an international monetary system in which they can retain their capacity to pursue developmentalist policies and not have anti-developmentalist policies imposed upon them, which the dollar system currently does. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Prof. Is there any other comment, question from people in the in the group before I can go to uh, other social media platform? Another hand is still up, or is there is still an old is, is the old, old hand? Your hand is still up, Kina. Uh, no, it is the, still the old hand. But if you are closing. I can say I want to thank you, Comrade Sidigo, for inviting me in this interesting uh, educational international politics and economy. And also thank the professor and all participants and say I'm looking forward to learn. You know that, uh, yeah, let me pause there. Thank you very much, Comrade Sidigo. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much, colleagues. I, I prepared so to learn going forward. Thank you so thank, thank you so much, Comrade Kina. Any other comments from people on on the chat before we go on and take questions? For, I mean, comments from uh, other platforms. Any other comments? When I look at my my Facebook page and other social media platforms, I don't see any other comments, props. Okay, there's another there's another uh, comment or a question, prof. Uh, in the in the chat box. If you can read that, please uh, attend to that, Prof. Okay, so uh, I would say that, um, uh, so which, which structure can be utilized to convene African countries to develop the multinational system 
to counter the dollar. So I would say that, like I said the, in my last slide, I ended up with a list of principles. So I, I think that, that those are the principles that you can use. So the, first of all, I would say that, you know, it's possible if the African Union wishes to create an African currency uh, to for use among African countries, African central banks to settle their mutual imbalances, I think this would be possible. Uh, but it you have to remember it should not be like it should be a currency which will be used only by central banks while each country continues using their central uh, their, their own national currency. Uh, central banks in Africa would use it to settle imbalances with one another um, and they it would it should be based on allowing permitting capital controls to exist, enforcing creditor responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. So all, those are the principles on which we have, those are principles we have to think about because otherwise you will inevitably end up creating the kind of crisis prone disorder that the dollar system is. So you have to think back to Keynes's principles at Bretton Woods. Yeah, the, the comment here is that, that I got from other social media platforms says, Prof, in your own view, is the world ready in case the U.S. dollar collapses tomorrow morning, is the world ready? Not really, no. I would say that too many people are still thinking of, you know, uh, where is, you know, looking for the successor country to the U.S. That is not where the answer lies. We have to build alternative arrangements. So we are definitely not ready, although to some extent people are ready in the sense that people are already, countries are already coming up with agreements to trade in one another's national currencies this is not an ideal arrangement let me give you an ex uh, re let me give you an example of why this is not ideal uh, with a very real world concrete example so recently over the last several years the us and russia sorry the, the india and russia have agreed to trade in one another's currency so rupee and ruble so russia accepts rupees in payment for its goods and india accepts rubles in payment for Russian, for, uh, so, uh, 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 sorry, Russia, yeah, uh, 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 and India accepts rubles in payment for its goods from Russia. The problem with this is that because uh, India imports a lot from Russia, primarily oil and other energy products, and Russia does not import an equivalent amount from India. So Russia is now complaining that it is sitting on top of um, uh, too many rupees that it doesn't know what to do with. So uh, this kind of, you know, you, you the reason why you need some kind of multilateral arrangement is that this kind of bilateral clearing inevitably gives rise to these problems. So you have to try to create a multilateral international clearing union, which will try to, so India may run a deficit vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but it may have a surplus vis-a-vis -vis some other country. So that would all balance out in the system. And that's what an international clearing union would do so um anyway so 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 those are those are some of the main principles that i think are important because the key thing is that the current system does not allow countries to develop if you want to have countries developing you have to have create an international monetary arrangement which will give every country the freedom to pursue the kind of monetary and fiscal policies that it needs to pursue to have genuine development, industrialization, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, these days, very importantly, sustainable forms of uh, industrialization, growth, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, I thought we'd be closing, but there are some more comments that, that are coming. Bro. Okay. And another comment is that, do you think the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank have got interest in the de-dollarization discussion? I would say not, uh, in the sense that they are both organizations that are dominated by U.S. by the U.S. and therefore they reflect U.S. concerns. So they are not eager for de-dollarization, uh, and within them, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, the, there is not. Um, yeah, I, I would say no, because they essentially they are creatures of the U.S. No, thank you so much. Is any other comments, colleagues? Before we close, we are left only with two minutes. The parting shots from you, Prof. Sorry. Any parting shots from you, Prof? Uh, no, I'm, 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 I'm happy for now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Prof, and thank you so much, colleagues, for participating.
we really appreciate your participation and we've learned a lot from Prof in terms of the neocolonialism and the, the, U, the, the US dollar uh, contradictions and complications. And we hope we can take this discussion further. The other thing I that uh, there's a request from, from, from colleagues is that please share your presentation with us so that uh, we can read it. And hopefully in the near future, we'll have another webinar. Thank you so much, Prof. For yeah, your I'll time. share we'll my presentation as well as the couple of the things that I can send you as files. I will, I will send you. Yeah. Thank please you so much. And have a lovely evening. Interested. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Evening. It was a great pleasure. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye.